we are rolling. Today is June 13th, 2014. I am Roger Soyset, accompanied by Ed Woods and Nathan Crutchfield with the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association, conducting an interview of Frank Head, a veteran, well, of a lot, uh, the Merchant Marine and the U.S. Army through the Korean War. Uh, we're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, doing this interview for the Library of Congress, uh, this being part of the Veterans History Project. Mr. Head, uh, would you care to give us a little background of yourself, sir? Well, I was born in old Fort uh, Campbell County, actually, just south of College Park in 1926. And I went to Red Oak Grammar School through the eighth grade. And then I moved to Campbell High School in Fairburn, where I finished high school in 1944. In 1944, uh, this is when you entered the Merchant Marine? Yeah, I joined the Merchant Marines in 1944 because I had two brothers in the Army and one in the Navy, and they all told me not to get in the Army if possible. You'd have a dry place to sleep unless you got sunk. So I stayed in there from 1944 to early part of 46. You had a rating of able seaman. Yes. What is that? That's, uh, we was in the deck department and we had uh, three men on a watch. And one hour you were on the wheel, which steer the ship. One hour you was on the lookout. And the other hour you was in, in the coffee room, making keep coffee for the next crew. And uh, I stayed in there from September of 1944 to early part of 46. And then after that, I started plumbing, got a job as a plumber. And in 1952, I got called up in the Army. Well, before your Army days, I'd be uh curious to find out some of the places you saw and the things you did in the Merchant Marine. Oh, still Merchant Marine. Well, uh, my first trip, they, they signed me to a Liberty ship in Savannah, Georgia. It was a completely new ship. It just got to painting it. And they sent us up the coast to New York. And we loaded up there in December of 44 and, and made a trip to England. It was in a convoy with 35 ships and two tankers got sunk the first night we were out and that was the only ships we had sunk in the convoy the rest of the way. We had escorts, destroy escorts followed us all the way across, so mm. we, they dropped a lot of dip charges, so I don't know of any more ships that got sunk in that trip. Well, where were you going? Going to England? Oh, England, I'm sorry. That where you heading, sir? Yeah, I went to England that yeah. trip, and then uh, the next ship, I, they let us go home after each trip. We could stay a minimum of 30 days. Then we had to re-sign back with another ship. So I went to Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, caught a trip out. We went to the Azor Islands, and we had, uh, I don't know how many barrels it was, but it was loaded with 55 drum of gasoline airplane fuel. And we went to the uh, Azores and the Azores didn't have any docks over there, so we had to anchor out away from the docks about half a mile, and they unloaded those barrels on the barges. 
and went in. And while we were doing that, one day the wind got up so bad that they didn't have any. They had a rock bottom like I heard. The anchor wouldn't hold, so we had to raise the anchor up, go out and get on the other side of the island and sail around for a day and a half till the wind died down a little where we could get back in. We got unloaded and finally and did pretty good on the way back. We ran out of it. pretty much all the food we had on there. We had beans and rice one day and rice and beans the next. Oh, so we'll mix it up. Huh? They uh, <laughs> made it. The next uh, trip was... You said something about the ship was so much lighter on the way back. Oh yeah, it, without any Ballast fuel in it, there, that yeah. was, it was sitting up high out of the water and we got into a pretty good storm coming into Cape Hatteras up there and I was about as afraid of that night as I was when the to dip charges were going on. <laughs> Next trip I went to Italy and uh, that was pretty calm trip at the, at that time it was pretty much slowed down on the submarine that had got them out of control mm -hmm. much. And then the last trip I made was to the Philippine Islands. They still had going on with Japan. And we had to run a zigzag course. And that was a long trip on a zigzag course. But about halfway over there, they dropped the atomic bomb. And we had 90,000 cases of beer on that thing. And uh, we tried to get that dumb lieutenant in charge to have a celebration, but he said, no, we can't do it. So we got to the Philippine Islands and unloaded. And needless to say, we got some of that beer while we was unloaded because we, the deck department had to unload one hole. And we filled up a 55, a five gallon bucket and froze it in the freezer overnight and took it, loaded it down. <laughs> And then we drank a lot of those little beers. <laughs> so that was that was the end of the, my sailing days, and I paid off it in New Orleans with nine hundred and something dollars. That's the most I'd ever had in my pocket at one time. What, when was this? That was in 1945. They, uh, that was a, I think that was the last time the Cubs was in the World Series. <laughs> they, they played. Uh, they played uh, Detroit Tigers. Hank Greenberg had just got back out of the army, and he went to playing ball. Listened to it on the radio. And that was that was my sailing days. Okay, then we're up to nineteen. Well, I'm sorry. We're up to your plumbing days. Oh. You went and became a plumber. Yeah, I got a job with a, an old plumber. He was about 60 years old then, and he used to rabbit hunt with us all the time. And my mama asked him one day, said, can't you get Frank a job up there where you work? And he said, yeah, I'll see. So gone and sat on Sunday night. He called me and said, uh, how about meet me up here at so-and-so? I -and -so? got a little old house, we're going to rough it in. So I didn't know what to wear. And I put on a pair of dress pants and went up there that morning. He put me in a thread and pipe. I didn't have those electric things back then. You had them old kind of crank and crank mm -hmm. and crank. Man, I had me a pair of overalls on <laughs> when I went back for the second day. <laughs> And I started plumbing in 1947, and I quit about December of 2013. 65 years, I stayed the same job. And that ended my plumbing. Well, then comes 1952. Yeah, I'd been married I got married in 1947, and I thought everything is on the road up. And I got that little call, report to the 
up to somewhere there across from Reaches, that building, I don't know what it was, but I had to go up there and in just a few days they put me on a bus and it's Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and from there was, mm -hmm. I thought they'd put me in something like the motor pool since I've been doing plumbing, put me in the medical corps. So A different kind of plumbing. Yeah, entirely <laughs> different. <laughs> So they sent me from there to Camp Pickett, Virginia, and I stayed there 16 weeks. Actually, it was uh, 20 weeks, because I went to a leadership school there for four months. And then I came home for 30 days and caught a four-engine plane and flew to St. Camp Stoneman, California. And then I went out of there to uh, Tokyo, they dropped me off at Tokyo. And then from there we went on to Korea. What was the situation in Korea when you got there? Well, they was, you know, they had the peace talks going on and uh, we uh, stayed there about kind of in the rear back there, you know, we was doing nothing but guard duty and stuff like that. and. Uh, they come out one morning and told us we were getting ready to we were going up somewhere. We didn't know where we was going. And you know, they didn't give uh, medics rifles back then. So I went to the guy head of the aid station down there and I told him, I said, I ain't going up there without something to shoot back with. And he said, well, I got a carbine here. You signed it over to me. Yeah. And so we got put us a, walking about three or four miles there. And we come to this hill sitting out there about 400 yards in front of the main line. And uh, that's where we was, was headed. And as we was going up the road on one side, about seven, eight, ten yards apart, the people we was relieving was coming off going back to the line. They said, you all better get ready. I said, they usually get you that first night. And I thought, oh, they just talking. So we got up there and the lieutenant or somebody kind of got around there and telling us get what to do, you know, and said, now, there's one place in that trench over there where they've been hit with artillery so much, it's, it's only about waist high. I said, when you go by there, get down low. So it wasn't 30 minutes that so somebody hollered medic. And some idiot had walked around there and he'd hit him up there and almost came out back there on the spine. It was still sticking there. He turned purple where it was, didn't quite come through on the backside. Wow. He was about 500 yards across on that mountain on the other side now. Had some boy, I think they call it an elephant gun. And uh, so that was my first patch job. I patched him up and they sent him on back down to the, they had an aid station down there about 150 yards down the hill there. And uh, that was the first time I, I had to patch anybody up. That was the uh, Outpost Harry, you were Yeah, yeah, on Outpost Harry. Now, what is the approximate location of this hilltop? <coughs> you mean from the main line? From, well... 38th parallel. We're right up okay. to 38th parallel. You're right parallel. up there at the north, okay. We're south of yeah. it, and uh, it was, I believe they, were, they told us it was 400 and something yards from our main line. And the Ch Chinese that's on this mountain is good bit higher than we were and they was only 300 and something yards away and we were supposed to hold it to keep them from coming up the valley and get to the main line yeah. so anyway they they hit us that first night and uh, I don't know how many people got hit but I know they was two killed on top where they had set up a 50 caliber machine gun right up on top of the hill and 
the round came in there and just tore them up. There's one guy had his leg blowed off about here. Wow. Were you able to help him? No, we, had, I, we got him down the hill the next morning because they were dead oh. right there. And his boot kept falling off and that's not it. we'd have to set him down. Had two guys on one and two guys on the other. Yeah. And that terrain was about like that. And uh, it fell off three or four times before I got him down the bottom of the hill. Wow. And, what what uh, time of the year? That was in uh, in June, but I can't, I can't remember the date. Oh, no, that's fine. I it's just, June of... It's 1953. 53, yeah. Yeah, I just know it was, had, there were occasions yeah, where it was right. extremely cold in Korea. Huh? Yeah, well, it, it was hot back then. and uh, But uh, yeah, we didn't... I don't remember how many days, nights we spent up there. What, it was... I was thinking it was two or three, but because I know we all had a beard and we had to had shaved or washed or nothing else, and they said you're gonna have to shave. The general was coming around and look tomorrow. I thought, God. <laughs> so I shaved, but I uh, I didn't go to the bathroom. The only time I went to the bathroom when I went back down to that little place down there called the Forward Aid Station. They had a little thing about this wide up there with a hole cut in it up here and sitting there. And I said, I ain't gonna be caught with my pants down up here. <laughs> and I didn't, but I'll tell you what, that was, we, I wouldn't want to have to stay in that place many times because if they wanted to take it, they had enough men, they could take it. Because they were coming in they didn't take it that night because they, we had artillery tanks back there firing all down in there where they were. They probably killed two or three hundred of them that night. But they didn't mind it. They were kind of fanatical anyway. And I was glad to get relief from that and then just to say. I'll bet. So were they you there us, for that whole week during this assault on... Outpost Harry? We didn't stay up there quite a week. I don't okay. know. It seemed like it was more than two days, but yeah. And uh, but I know that after we got back to the our main line, we stayed there a few days. But I, the night we were moving out to go back to a new location, they took it over. They could take it over if they really wanted to lose enough men. Mm -hmm because there wasn't no way you could hold them back. See, they'd fire, they, we could fire down in the valley and sometime and with one of those tanks, it would uh, slow them down. But if he was determined to take it, they took it several times. And then they would uh, send enough of our men back up there and bomb it with the planes, stuff like that. It was, they had those bunkers made out of Looked like 18 inch cross ties and and they, they'd they had to replace some of them every once in a while. Wow. There was a Congressional Medal of Honor won during this uh, week. Uh, Master Sergeant Byes, did you know no, about I him? No, I didn't know him. I saw that in that book I got. Uh -huh. But they, I think it's about 300 and something lost their lives up there. Wow. On that one hill. But they could, like I say, we could take it back, but they, they'd take it back too if we wanted to put enough of men in there. We had one guy, black guy, that was, he was down, next bunker down from where I was staying. And just about every night he'd cut loose that 30 caliber. I said, what in the world is he shooting at? Every time a rat had run over some sea ration cans or something, make a racket, he'd cut loose and said, that guy, the lieutenant said, don't worry, let him shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and we had plenty of ammunition, I'll say that for him. Wow. Well, how long were you, was it a, 
You were there until the Korean War ended uh, yeah. when the armistice came? Yeah, well, they moved. When, after we uh, went back to the main line, we stayed there about two nights, and then we they moved us back uh, to another position. We stayed there yeah. a few days, and then they put us on a march one time. We didn't know, you know, how tales to get out about what we're going home and all that stuff. They said, I think we're going to the rear. I had my litter and my bag and mm -hmm. carbine and trudging off through the hills and didn't have no idea where we was going. Finally got over the next day and was going up there. The Chinese had a, a place over there somewhere. Show you on the map, but that ain't too much help to me. And uh, they were, we were going to go up there and make a raid and t take over the trenches where they were in. Though. Well, it took us a long when they was shooting flares and all that stuff. They knew we was coming a long time before we got there. <laughs> and so they called back to the main line and said, they're they waiting on us. And they told us, that, well, go ahead tonight or you wait tomorrow and make a daylight raid. And so that's what they did. And we got up there and they was cut down on us before we knew it. Wow. I had one guy got hit in the rear and I patched him up and put him on that litter and had, we had two Korean civilians that went with us to carry a hand grenade. They'd put a whole case of hand grenades on the back with that combo wire and carry it up the hill. And uh, they, uh, I had got a couple of them, got that guy on the litter and she headed him on back down. And then as we was going down, back to our line down there, they were shooting mortars and everything down through there. And every time that Korean, he jumped down and put that thing down. I, I had lost my carbine because a guy came up to me up there and, and said, uh, is that car being working? I said, I guess it is. I ain't had time to fire it. <laughs> and so he said, I got an M1 here. I said, just give it to me. So I took that M1. I had a bayonet already on it. And every time that Korean dropped that thing, I said, pick that thing up. <laughs> Ram was seen. I believe I would. <laughs> but we yeah. finally got on down to, back down there. And here it was, call me down, medic, medic, medic. There was a sergeant down there that the bullet had hit his helmet and ricocheted down the back. And his, it had just barely broke the skin on his head. If it had been a half inch, the wow. Lord took school. Yeah. <laughs> he was a gray. He was, so I doctored him up. All, all I had to do was cut some of that hair out and put a little methylate on him. And he could sent him on back to the aid station. But they uh, had a, another guy there that got hit right along in here, and it was just dangling there, and I said, he was taking on, so I tied that old, you know how that old 30 caliber ammunition belt? Well, I just took it, I had some of them on my side, and I tied a square knot in it. I didn't say it would keep it clean or nothing. And I thought, I said, if, if he lives, he'll be lucky if he don't bleed to death. So I took that serrette and went around there and it, they always told us to squirt about half of it out, don't give them all that one time. And I gave him a shot of morphine and he just calmed down. And I found out later on they saved his arm. Didn't have to cut it off. And that's, there's a lot more of it, but I mean, I can't think of anything else right well, now. Let me ask you a question. How did they choose you to be a medic? Well, that's what I wonder. So <coughs> they you had uh, no training prior to They, they asked you questions in there, you know, about how the thread and all, and I knew all that stuff, and I said, well, they'll probably put me in the motor pool at least. And I don't know, because I never, Hmm. doctored anybody. Of course, I, when I got to the Japan, I stayed there 
five months before they sent me on the career, I went to the aid down to the, I had a couple of things on my leg here and uh, I went down there and they, this guy come in there and looked at it. He said, I ain't never seen anything like that. I said, we're gonna send you down to the general hospital. I thought, good Lord, for that. So the next morning, he gave me a little thing, slip, you know, and so the next morning, I fell, they fell us out. See, in Japan there, they had, they had uh, the mess hall, living quarters, tool shed and everything else under one roof. They have a whole battalion of men in one building. Hmm. Fell out and he said, Head, yeah. He said, where are you doing in the dress uniform? I said, I'm going to the hospital. He said, who says so? I said, this was a piece of paper. And it, he didn't like that and he, he would, some of those guys come over to visit, you know. They'd say, that old doc, that old sergeant still asking, when's the head going to come back over? <laughs> and I said, man, he done, that, doc, that, that captain already told me, he said, we can keep you here five months on medical hold. Because I'd been hipping out on the ward. I, I mean, I, what I had wasn't bad enough to not take, they give me a job of taking the temperature and pulse. And I wore uh, pajamas for five months. I'd go down through that taking puss and all. And I saw two or three people die in there, so I done got used to that pretty much. Mm. And they had a, it was on a burn ward where those guys get burned all over, you know. God, you talk about a pain mm. and a mess, that thing. That was a job for the guy to go through. But I, I stayed there and that was about it, I guess. The best, you know, you said earlier that Korea was the forgotten war. Yeah. Uh, most Americans probably wouldn't really know too much about it except for MASH, the movie series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm assuming you've seen some of that. Uh, what do you think of it? Mash, well, I mean, I didn't ever see anything that comical about it when I was over there. I mean, of course, I never was around a Mash hospital, but yeah. they had, we had the helicopters. You'd see them going down that, about that high above the road, going to the Mash hospital, which was probably 15, 20 miles on down the road. Mm -hmm. But, uh, That low, huh? I mean, just real, just yeah, they're just about 10 foot off the ground. Follow the road down through there. Wow. I guess that'd make them harder to hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, since you got out of the service, uh, what's your, what, did you go back to plumbing? Yeah, sure did. I went back to plumbing and went in business myself in 1959. And till 2013. And now you're retired, I guess. I'm retired, finally retired. Yeah. Uh, something that's going on right now that's uh, getting a lot of attention is the problems at the Veterans Administration Hospital. Uh, have you? Uh, use yeah. those services and what do you think about that? I never have used the services but it hadn't been too good for a long time. I mean I know people that's been out there and all but they're gonna have to do something about it. Okay well did you want to make any kind of closing statement about your thoughts on service, uh, about what you saw and maybe what you'd like to be remembered by? Well, I didn't, didn't particularly want to, really want to go because I'd been married five years, but 
But when I got over there and I, I, some of the things I did, I'm glad I went. Yeah. You were ranked as a uh, corporal when I got out. You were a corporal. Yeah, just before I got out. Okay, so I think they did that to try to get me to re-enlist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they give it away sometimes, don't they? Yeah, when I looked at your highest rank here, I thought this said captain. I was going, well, wait a minute. Okay. That must be my right. Well, that's <laughs> just my reading. <laughs> uh, you said you've gotten a, a book that's uh, particularly good that tells the story about Post Harry. Yeah. Uh, I th I think this is something probably more people need to know about. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to promote that. Yeah, we had a fellow in our church, was, he was a choir director, and was having a thing there one time, I said, I was going to get him, get him to play the, they'd have you stand up when you song, or if you're in the Army, Navy, Marines, yeah, and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. So I asked him about it. I said, how about if you play the Merchant Marine song? Well, he's, a, he's good, I mean, on that piano and all. So I got to, I told him about it. He got on the internet, and he got a, a whole sheet sent to him with all his things, so they played that thing. <laughs> Them, some of those other girls on the piano and organ they had a hard time keeping up with it because it was yeah. fast moving, you know. And uh, that's pretty good. I got that. That's when this boy, he uh, got, he went on the internet and got checking on Merch Marines. He'd never heard. He said, I didn't realize that many people got killed. I said, she would tell they knocking them off. Of, half of them got sunk before they got to England. They're in the 40 and 41 along in there. What were the casualties of the Merchant Marine? Well, you know how many people? I think in the all total, I think it's 37,000. Wow. I, wow. I read one time where there was a, these two guys on the ship going to Murmansk, Russia, and they got sunk on the way over there. Russian ship picked them up and they carried them on and went, they got a sign on another ship coming out and got sunk again and still made it through. That might have wow. been their last trip yeah, <laughs> when they got they back. They might not have wanted to do that again. <laughs> no. Why did you go into the Merchant Marines? How? No, why? To avoid the army, I think you said. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> to avoid the army, yeah. I, I, yeah. Mean, I recall that story, okay. but you, you. Yeah, I had one brother was in Italy in the army. He in he was in the medical corps. Yeah. Maybe that's why you got medics when you. I don't know. <laughs> and my other one, he was over there with Patton, and and my brother, he was in the navy. So, hmm. I had another brother, but he he had cataracts on his eyes, and he couldn't hmm. go. Did all your brothers make it back? Yeah. Good. Did, uh, could you mention where you, where you enlisted? At? I mean, you talked about the guy enlisting you. Uh, no, you said across from Richard. Marines. Oh, the arcade. Uh, what was that, the arcade? Petrie Arcade. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Little old bitty hole in the wall there. <laughs> yep. Uh, did you have some pictures? Uh, that uh, you might want to get on the video here. Oh, that's one that you did, made with. This is a group, of, let's see, there's two of these here guys. Let's see, this, this was one of these guys got killed. He was up on outpost Harry with us and he kind of cracked up. You might say he couldn't take it. 
and they put him in the Gray's registration. Oh, 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 wow. Okay, great. And he was in the Gray's registration, and he stepped on a mine and got killed. So are you in this picture? Yeah. Which one are you? That right there. Okay. That good looking guy. Wearing a hat then you too. Pick out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, sir. Any other pictures that you wanted to get on the on the video? Did you have that in the about post Terry? Let's see, I'm not sure we took that one. I know there's a maybe a picture of one of the Liberty ships in there. That'd be there good. Is, there is. Heard my ball playing days. There you go, that's a good one right there. That's me and my uniform. Okay. Very good. There you go. Good enough. Yes, sir. That's uh, good old canvas tents. So Those suckers, that thing probably weighed a couple hundred That's pounds. That's my mom and daddy there. I don't get you on that. Sure. Yeah. Nice family shot. How did they feel about you going into the Merchant Marine? You had other well, brothers that were serving. Were they worried? I'm sure they were. They didn't. They knew we were going to have to do it, so we were not do it. I just caught the bus and went to town. When I come home, I caught the train in New York, come home, caught the streetcar, and fared the bus home. <laughs> that enough of that? This is my pet here. Where were you in that picture? We was in the rear, back behind the main line there that time. Before we went up. Hmm. That it? Yeah, that's good. This is a letter from my brother telling me some things, but you can't read that. To Telling you to join Birch's Army. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the Army Medical Army. School. You want to see that? Accommodation riddles and all that stuff. This is the one I, where we had a. When they had that day for me, it's. Just to wear your old uniform to church if you can. I don't imagine there's too many that can fit into the uniform that they wore 60 years ago. 70. 70? Well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that it? Yeah. Okay. And I got one here from my Merchant Marine days. That's me with my hat on and my cousin. He was a paratrooper, got dropped in a river and captured on D-Day. Ouch. <clears throat> So he spent a, his last year in a prisoner of war yeah. camp. Yeah. That it? Yeah. yeah. That enough? How about the Liberty ship? Okay. Tell us about the Liberty ship. Well, I just got a little bitty one. I had a big one. I think there's a big one in there, I think. Yeah, I, think, I don't think I got all these. Good Lord, who wrote all this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't know where it's in there or not. I got a little bitty picture in my pocket. Mm -hmm. 
Well, tell us what the Liberty ships were. A lot of people, I don't think, are very familiar with those. They were, uh, oh, this is, well, uh, this is Outpost Harry, and these are two of my medical buddies, and I'm taking a picture with a little bitty camera about that big. Right back up on that hill where those two guys were, got killed that night. Are those smoke grenades that they have? Some of them, we had uh, phosphorus grenades phosphorus, and everything. Yeah, they look like that. Yeah, too. hand grenades. You got that, did you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I just got to have that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Air shirts. <laughs> That's about 19. Now, would that be before Merchant Marine? That was probably about 1946 or somewhere like that after uh, I got out of Merchant Marine. Oh, just after. Was you in the Atlanta area at that time? Yeah. I've been living down there below college. This is me with all my medals. I don't think we got that in there. All right. Okay, you're going to tell us about your medals. <laughs> I can't remember that tell. What'd you do, my I discharge? I just happened to have a cheat sheet here. Uh, let's see, two bronze service stars, Korean service medal, United Nations service medal, National Defense, and the Combat Medical Badge. Yeah, that's my proudest one. That's probably the one that means the most to you. Yeah. How many Liberty ships were there? Total, do you know? I'll read that book. It'll tell you. I guarantee them, it's in yeah. there, but I don't remember. They was making them one a day. Yeah, I'd heard that it was one of the manufacturing miracles. We there's were a lot kicking them out. There's a lot of them uh, cracked in too. They were just was, welded together. They too, wouldn't. Yeah. That's the reason I didn't want to be in the deck department. I mean, in the downstairs. Downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> but they had a had a flaw in the metal. Yeah. They'd squeak sometime when they roll from side to side. I forgot one thing to tell you. It was funny. At the first ship we got sailed on, we didn't have a full crew because we were going up to New York. And it gets rough just going up the coast to right Cape Hatteras up there. So this old Liberty ship was sitting up out of the water so high. And on the ship, you got a oh, it's panel down there, close to the floor, about this big. That in case you doors locked, you just kick it out. So I was up on the top bunk on one side, and this old guy, he was an old sailor, weighed about two hundred pounds, or fat and big and ugly, and he. Uh, <laughs> We was going up through there and it started getting in some rough weather and that was the first time I'd ever been off farm. That thing was rolling and rolling all at once that I had the dang this racket in that old his name was Mitz and he said, Oh my god, they got one. We got one. I flipped the latch on that door to the latch and it went to it and knocked the panel out. And I just went through the panel instead of waiting to open the door. I went up on the deck, boat deck. <laughs> he come up there and laughed. And then there's two or three other people over there that time, of course. And he just, he pulled that trick on me. <laughs> and that, what had happened, that garbage can, is somebody didn't lash it down in the kitchen in there, and it went across once. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yes, you had to have just about everything tied down, didn't you? Yeah, oh yeah. We had them. We had a lot of cargo on the on the deck too. You know, they'd fill all those, t put t two or three trucks on here and a jeep or two over here, and and uh, on the uh, when he was in a war zone, they put. They were. I think I might have told you thirty. 30 uh, armed guard on our Navy men. They had uh, four 20 millimeter 
anti-aircraft guns on there and had a three inch, 50 on the bow, I believe it was, and a five inch mm. cannon on the back. They, they practiced with us sometimes, but we never did, they never did have to shoot them. Doubt if you could hit anything with them anyway. Uh, you did mention uh, two ships were sunk. Well, that was uh, first night. Were you able to, does the convoy have to keep going when you have something like this, or do you stop to pick yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, we, in fact, I'll tell you about that. We had a guy on the first trip we made, he went crazy, and they had to lash him down, chain him. Of course, he was raised in Canada. And uh, so we got along there, Nova Scotia along there, Newfoundland. We had, they had radioed it. So one day I was on the wheel and they said, hard right. And we pulled out of the convoy. And they, it was rough weather too. And that hospital ship sent a little old dingy looking thing out, I mean, they came over there and picked that guy up. They put him in a they put him in a basket and lowered him down. And we had to sit there and watch that convoy go. And I said, "Man, let's get this thing moving." You all by yourself. You you <laughs> sit right there. You wait till they can't wait on you. And so we we made it. Something tell me about some dolphins that we used to follow the ships or do something. Yeah, yeah. To... they would. Uh, it, we'd be on on when the weather was decent. We'd uh, one of the men in the deck department on each watch. He'd have to be up in the bow, where you on the lookout. You know, keep him running into ship in front of you or something in case in the fog. He could warn him. Had a cell phone up. Out. And I used to, I got up there one night and I saw these doggone things and they'd be swimming along right with you and then they'd just go off and leave you. And then they could turn and you'd never know it till he'd be going the other way and they'd come get right there like that and go hit that bow and he'd get back there just playing. And another time, I, one of the, when we had that airplane fuel on there was coming up the coast to hit the route they was going. And I was out on the wing of the bridge up there, which is sticking out right over the water. I saw something say, Phew. Phew. I knew it. I said, if that's a torpedo, ain't no use me saying that now, because I saw I just got a hold of this thing. I went on, and then I went in and <laughs> told that, that uh, second mate, I said, I said, something happened to you a while ago. I said, but I knew it was too late. <laughs> I thought it was a torpedo. <laughs> he said, that was a school of porpoise. <laughs> it cut through the water, it had white phosphorus, you know how it, in the water, the yeah. phosphorus, it like it's lit up, you know. Hmm. But that uh, <laughs> was kind of funny. Yeah, that's, that's the deal where the old hands know and they probably let the new hands find out the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I found out that I could get on the boat deck pretty quick. <laughs> and I wore a pea coat, I mean a, a life jacket, all the way across and back on that first trip. That was an uncomfortable thing, this old bulky, me West looking thing. Mm -hmm. Cram it up around your neck. I said, they done told us if you hit that water in the North Atlantic in wintertime, if you don't get on something in three minutes, you're gone. <laughs> And so I was ready. I said, I'm going to have my jacket on. <laughs> so I guess uh, swimming wasn't a required skill to be in the Merchant Marine? No, the main thing is they taught me is don't never jump in there and dive in there like a belly flop. Go in, hands by your side. We had a tower out there at the swimming pool, one of them 10 foot tower, and the next one that's 20. That you walk out on this plank. Mm -hmm and take a step and go, you're supposed to go straight in. First time I got up there, I had an inkling to look down a little bit and I did, I hit about a half belly button. Ooh. He said, come back up your head. 
Back up that ladder. He said, see that little white building up yonder in St. Petersburg? I said, yes. Yeah. said, step off with your left foot and don't take your eyes off that building and bring your other foot up. I went nine foot to the bottom and kissed him. He didn't have to tell me no more. Because if you go to the next one, you, he can't, he wouldn't let you come back down. You chicken out, you go up there, you're going to jump off it. That's what they said. I didn't ever go up there. <laughs> Why would you go up to the higher one? Why the, would I? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of guys want to be gung-ho, but I wasn't gung-ho. <laughs> okay, that was voluntary then. Huh? Yeah. Okay, I was wondering they if that told was punishment. Us, <laughs> they told us, don't go up there unless you're going to jump off. Okay. <laughs> okay, sir. Well, this has been quite a... Uh, interesting session to put it mildly uh, learning about your experiences and uh, we appreciate your time and your service and I realize I did uh, omit one thing of note here our uh, Sue Verhoff is also part of our crew here doing this interview today she's the employee with the Atlanta History Center so uh, all of us thank you for your time and uh, I guess that about wraps it up Thank you. Thank you. So you mean you've been listening all this time? Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs>